we began our study of the doctrine of predestination and election, you will recall that I started by turning to the pages of Paul's letter to the Ephesians because the word predestination is used there by the apostle and I explained at that time that if we are going to take the Bible seriously we have to have some doctrine of predestination because the idea of predestination wasn't invented by Calvin or Luther or Augustine it's a New Testament word and it's a New Testament concept but as we've been struggling with the question, why does God elect certain people and not others? Why is it that some people receive his grace while other people are receiving his justice? We've seen, I hope, that nobody in this format receives injustice at the hands of God and that God's mercy or grace is always his sovereign privilege to bestow according to however he sees fit or for whatever reason he's inclined to do it. But I want to move back now to that beginning chapter of Ephesians to explore this idea of why God gives grace to some and not others. What's the reason for it? Paul's already told us that it's not based on anything that we do. It's not based on our running or our willing or our doing anything, but it is based purely on the purpose of God. And let's see what Paul says again in the first chapter of Ephesians. Let's look again at verse 3 of chapter 1 of Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined, there's that word, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Again, what's the purpose here? This is to demonstrate the glory of the graciousness of God. That's what is being made manifest, because it was by this grace that he made us accepted in the beloved. And then we read on in verse 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, again, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. And then finally, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. You know, friends, I really don't see how the Apostle could make this any more clear. I, I'm really befuddled by why controversies over the sovereignty of grace continue on and on and on in the history of the church. But then I have to go back to my own experience in my own life where I fought this for so many years. But I don't think that this is an obscure idea. I don't see how Paul could spell it out with any greater clarity than he does here in Ephesians and later in Romans. But again, the question is, if God chooses some people to be objects of his saving grace and does not give that same blessing, that same favor to other people, and if the reason for his selecting some to receive this tremendous benefit and others not to get it but to be excluded from it, doesn't that just scream the idea that somehow God is arbitrary or capricious or whimsical? He may be not unjust, but he certainly seems to be arbitrary here. Now, let me address that question, and I don't want to just play word games with you, but let's take a moment to define what we mean by the term arbitrary or capriciousness or 
being whimsical. A person who is arbitrary does what they do without any reason. They just do it. You ask them why they did it, so no reason, they just did it. On a whim. It's a matter of caprice. Now, we don't have a lot of respect for capricious people who do things for no reason. In fact, if they really do it for no reason, they belong in the institution because that would be a kind of insanity. Now, are we going to attribute to God that kind of unvirtuous or vicious behavior that he is arbitrary and capricious? Now, some say, well, you have to, Sproul, because you have been laboring the point that God chooses people for no reasons foreseen or otherwise in them. And that's true. We are laboring to say that the reason why you are chosen by God in no way rests in you. There's no reason that God could find looking in me to save me, is there? unless he finds some kind of merit or righteousness in me that I have in greater abundance than other people, and now we're right back to salvation by works and back to legalism. No, no. We say clearly that his grace is given not for any reason in us. But the fact that there is no reason in me does not mean there is no reason behind God's action. And what the Bible is saying, as loudly on the one hand that it says that the reason for our election is not in us, does not mean that God is being whimsical and capricious and arbitrary because it repeats over and over again that God has a reason for doing this.